I grew up going to church, and uh, a lot of it. Like, I grew up Catholic. I went to a Catholic grade school. I went to church not just once a week, not just twice a week, but three times a week. That's how much better I am than you. I'm just kidding. So, but we, I went three times a week, and I, I knew what to expect when I walked in the doors. Some of you, I met a lot of new guests this morning. Again, if that's you, welcome home. We are so, so jacked up and excited that you're here. But you may not know what to expect. You probably didn't expect group prayer right away. Um, so I knew what to expect. Like when I walked in, I knew, okay, this is, we're going to sing some hymns here. There's going to be a choir. There's going to be that one gal uh, with playing the organ. Um, a guy's going to come out, long robe, and he's going to give a message and uh, we're going to, I knew the prayers, like the Lord's Prayer, other prayers that we would have memorized. I knew them all. I knew when they would happen and how they would happen. I knew when we would sit. I knew when we would stand. And I knew when we would kneel. That's right. We would kneel a lot. Like so much so that sometimes with my family in prayer or in church, I'd be kneeling and I'd get lazy because, uh, you know, I can get that way. So I would kind of sit back against the, against the pew, we'd call it, against the the bench, and I'd sit back like this, and my mom would look at me, and she'd give me that look, you know, the looks mom give. They don't have to say anything. She just would look at me like either, like, she, basically what she's saying is, even though she didn't say it, either do this or die. That's what she was saying. Either get back up, you know, straighten yourself up, you know, get right, but she didn't like when I would rest back, and, but I knew everything that was going to happen, and everything that uh, was going to go down. Fast forward 15 years later. For after, after high school. During that period, I, by and large, did not go to church. It wasn't for me. I wasn't mad at the church. No one hurt me. I just basically said, it ain't my thing. I don't see the value in it. Uh, time is valuable, and quite honestly, I was selfish and was either too tired, too hungover, uh, too uh, busy, or too tired, whatever it is, that I didn't go. But, but <laughs> you make enough stupid decisions, and I'm good at those. You make enough stupid decisions... And make enough mistakes, it'll drive you to your knees. And 15 years later, I was driven to my knees, and my family, my wife Jody and I, and our, our family went back to a local church, and because we knew we needed something, and there was something about the church, and there was something about what I was taught, and there was something about God, and I knew it wasn't there, and I wanted it. So we go back to a church, and I'm going to tell you something. This time, it wasn't what I expected. Like, because the only church you know is the church you've known, right? That's why when people say, I wish we'd do this or I wish we'd do that, they probably wish that because that's maybe how they grew up and that's what they're used to and we get comfortable with that. But when I walked into this church, there was no lady with, on the organ, okay? There were no hymns be, being, being sang. There was no guy in some big long robe. When I walked in, there was like loud music, okay? Lights and, 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 and people, there was no one kneeling, nobody. They were standing, and they weren't just standing, but they were like raising their hands. Like they had questions. I thought, Why? what's going on here? I thought either we should stop and answer their questions, or, or these people are just weird, okay? Turns out they were weird. So, uh, but people were doing things I wasn't used to. We left that day, and I'll tell you what, I was, I'll never forget the way, how I felt. And this is my prayer for you, especially if you're new, but even if you're not, that you would have the same Holy Spirit feeling. I can't tell you today one song they sang. I have no idea. I cannot tell you one word. I hope the pastor said Jesus. I'm guessing he did. But I can't tell you what he preached on. I can't tell you what scriptures he talked about. I have no idea. I just know that when I was leaving that day, I somehow felt this love. And I, I somehow felt this, this sense of like belonging and this sense of acceptance and this sense of like overwhelming, like we care about you. And even though I don't remember anything that was said, I know that's how I felt. But, but when I left that day, here's what I wasn't thinking. I didn't think to myself, one day, I'm going to like, I'll probably serve in this church like in the kids' ministry every week. I'm going to just do that. I, that was not on my mind. I didn't think one day, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to oversee a kids' ministry. They're, like they're gonna, I'm going to work for the church. I'm going to quit my job. That was not on the radar. I didn't think one day I'm going to be the campus pastor at this church, and they're going to launch a location across town, and I'm going to lead it. I mean, that would be laughable. I was not thinking that. And I certainly wasn't thinking one day I, my family, others, we're going to move to the great state of Nebraska, go Big Red, and we are going to plant a church in the Serpy County area. That is, <laughs> those were not my plans. 
But how many of you know that God's plans are bigger? Yeah. That God's plans are bigger. Those were not my plans. I, I, <laughs> you know what my plan was leaving church that day? Here was my plan. Just get through the day. That, that's all I wanted to do. I felt loved. I felt valued. This church, something special about that church. I thought, I just need to get through the day. I, I, I just need to stay married to my wife. I just need to stay clean. I just need to, here's what I thought. I just need to survive. I just, and maybe that's where you're at today. Or maybe somebody you know. You're, you're at a place where you're not expecting much in the service. You're not expecting much from God or anybody in your life. You're like, I just need to survive. I just need to get through. But I came to tell you, just like I shared earlier, that might be your plan, but God's plans are bigger. God's plans are so much bigger. When, when we moved and we started the Meadows Church, like, God's plans were so much bigger than ours. We thought the plan right away was, of course, Meadows. And God's like, you think so small. I've got such bigger plans. I've got such grand plans. I wrote down the reality is when he called us to start Meadows, his plans were way bigger than just Meadows Church. This is why a few years after we launched, we planted Crossover Church in Bennington, Nebraska. And, and this is why God's got bigger plans for your church. So you're going to get some incredible vision casting today. But I need to give you this scripture because this is so crucial for you and what God has for you today. Proverbs 16.9 we can make our plans, and you should, but the Lord determines the steps. You should make plans, but no, the Lord determines your steps. This sounds good, and it looks great on a t-shirt or a coffee cup, or maybe a tattoo in an appropriate spot, but I'm, here's what I'm going to tell you. The, the Lord determines your steps, but he's not going to make you step into them. This is true for, for, for everybody, but most people... They're not walking in the Lord's steps. The Lord says, I've determined this path for you. How many people are doing this? I've did it most of my life. The Lord says, I've determined a way. And my, and this, if you take this path, my, my plans there are great. So, so it's, it's key that we understand the Lord determines our steps, but you have to walk in those steps. And the more that you seek the Lord, like you're doing this morning in the bride of Christ, the more you're going to understand the steps that God has for you. And you will be given the courage, you'll be given the obedience, you'll be given the faithfulness to walk in those steps. So, so I want to give you a tangible picture of, of what that looks like when it comes to your church and, and your life. This is so pertinent to you. But to tell the story, I want to invite up uh, Dave and Tanya Gifford to come to the stage. Would you give it up for them as they come up? So Dave and Tanya, I'll just kind of set it up as they walk up. They, I met Tanya before Dave because Tanya loves Jesus a little bit more than Dave does. But anyway, we'll talk about that. And uh, you, you can just grab a mic. And uh, just make sure it's on, flip it on. I don't know how to do those things, but you'll figure it out. So bring this over here. All right, so Dave and Tanya, well, I'm going to ask a question to Tanya. I don't want to, I'm not going to answer this for you. Tanya, you start coming to Meadows first five years ago, roughly. We just celebrated our. We just celebrated seven years, right? Yeah. So six years. Ago. Six years ago. Okay. No, we celebrated six years. Six years. So We're then on five seven years. years. Yeah. <laughs> We're already confused. So, so five years. So five years ago, you walked through the doors of Meadows Church. We're not at this location, but we're still this church. And I got to ask you this, and I'm so excited too. We're talking about our plans versus God's plans. What were your plans? I mean, you, you come to a church, you're stepping in for the first time, you were invited. Uh, I mean, what, what, what were your expectations? What were your plans? My truthful plans were just to hang out with my friends, have some fellowship, and um, just kind of get a, a renewed faith. We were attending a Lutheran church, and I just wanted something more. I kind of like your story that you were saying this morning. I knew the routine. About every two to three years, I knew the sermon. <laughs> So I um, started coming with Mindy, and uh, I just really enjoyed the energy. That's awesome. And I think that's a pretty normal answer. We come because we want to you know, go to church. We want to see some people. We want to hear about God, all that. It's all good, but we don't have these grander ideas. And uh, so you came for a year, roughly, and, uh, and then Dave finally got on board. So it's all good. It, it takes a little time. Yeah. Guys, you're yeah. slow. So me included. Um, so, Dave, you start coming roughly a year later. When you started to come, uh, what were your plans? You stepped into a new church? 
So after I started coming to Meadows, shortly thereafter, um, I was offered a chance to go through training to become a chaplain. So I thought that was my, uh, the direction I was gonna go. And uh, my initial thought was, yeah, I'll become a chaplain and I can be the chaplain for the fire department I'm on. And you know, that was pretty much the whole idea behind it. So it was to really complement this new calling of being a chaplain. Yeah. Yeah. So you've been in the you've been in the military. You served in the military. You've been in a first responder, an EMT, and a first responder in many different capacities. That's what you knew, and you felt a calling to to be a chaplain. I love that. That was that. So those were your plans. God's plans we know are different. Today is a different season, pun intended. Um, but you'll <laughs> so. What has God done now? Those are your plans. Where are we at today? What has God done, I guess, in your lives through the church? So, be three years now? Yeah, two, we're in 23. So, right at the peak of COVID, um, I'd finished chaplain training. Um, I actually wasn't a chaplain for the uh, fire department at that time. Um, I just had been a chaplain helping out with a chaplain corps in the area. And I was working in the emergency room as a paramedic. And working one night, we had a gentleman who had come in earlier. Uh, he was young, like 50, difficulty breathing. So we're all thinking, oh, COVID. And when we got the CTs back and everything, it had nothing to do with COVID. He actually had cancer throughout his whole body. Mm -hmm. And he went on hospice that night. Wow. Well, because of all the beds being used up and everything going on, he spent the night in the ER because we had nowhere for him to go at that moment. About two in the morning, um, he got... I still get emotional, sorry. About two in the morning, he had a uh, uh, crisis of faith. Um, he was worried about whether or not he had done enough good to go to heaven. And uh, so our chaplain for the hospital couldn't come in. So the charge nurse asked if I'd go in and talk with this guy. And I'm thinking, yeah, sure, I'm a chaplain. I can go do this. So I grab my Bible and I go in there. And we end up having this conversation about 30, 45 minutes. If you ask me what the conversation specifics, I cannot remember them. Um, I honestly don't think it was really me talking. I think it was the Holy Spirit talking through me. But I do remember we talked about it was faith and God's grace, and that's how we're saved. It has nothing to do with what we do on earth. And part of it kind of resonated with me because part of why I became a medic and first responder was... I, I kind of think I had that mentality where I had to go and help people in, to do good things and do right things. During the conversation, though, after about 30, 45 minutes, he looks at me and he goes, I'm good. And he relaxed. And he actually went to sleep. And I left there, just tears coming out. I had to go to the bathroom, recompose myself. And I'm sitting there going, okay, there's something just, what, what is this? And I realized all that time being a paramedic, I was helping people, but he had a bigger plan. He didn't want me helping so much physically as he did spiritually. And that's when I had my calling to be a pastor. And I really, like, okay, what, what am I going to do is this? And I'm trying to understand all this. Three days later, he comes back in, in the ER. And as he's passing, uh, his brother, me, and a priest were praying with him. And that's when I had a calling to uh, plant the church. So I came to Monty uh, that following Sunday, and I'm like, hey, how, how, do you, how do you become a pastor? And Monty looked at me. I said, you don't want that. <laughs> he took a step, and he, and he looked at me, and he, he took another step, and then he took a third step. You're serious, aren't you? <laughs> you know, he, he had no expectation. And so for the last two, two and a half years, I've been taking uh, classes through Oklahoma Wesleyan, Monty's been a great uh, coach, uh, teaching me along the way, doing weddings, uh, funerals, and other activities for the church, and now we are looking to plant all seasons. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> Five years ago, when Tanya stepped into church all seasons, being a part of a, leading a church wasn't her goal. Four years ago, when Dave would step in, leading a church wasn't his plan, but God's plans are bigger. So All Seasons is on the cusp. We know, maybe you don't know, the goal is to launch, right, in Easter of 2024, so Easter of next year. It's going to come quick. For people that are just getting a glimpse of All Seasons, what, what, what's that church going to be about? What would you tell them? What's the, what's the goal? What's the purpose of All Seasons Church that's going to launch in 
uh, Old Town Bellevue, Nebraska. So we, we, we did take one thing from Meadows on this, and we truly want to be that church where it's okay not to be okay. We are not looking for anybody to come in and have it all down. That's why we say the name of the church is All Seasons. Everyone's at different stages in life. Everyone's at different stages of faith. And we want a place where they can feel come and feel comfortable. Uh, we're meeting in an office space right now on Wednesday nights. There's, there's nothing churchy when you stand outside the building about it, what it looks like. But we think that actually offers a little bit of comfort and ease for people coming to visit the first time. Um, we are obviously we have a heart for veterans and first responders. You know, I've been a first responder 30 years. I was in the military for nine. And we just want to help those people that are anxious, that are distressed in the community, and they're looking for a place for an answer. And we want to help guide them, our mission, guide people um, to Christ through all seasons of life. We just want to lead them to him in the answers and the love and the, the joy that he can offer. So that's, that's it. That's good. All seasons of life, we go through that, don't we? Tanya, anything you want to add there? No, just... Um... You know, really, when you get to experience the energy here and, and when Monty talks about life groups and purpose groups, and I hope that, you know, we're, I think we're three, four weeks in now on purpose groups. Um, I just hope that you're going in with an open mind because I was not. I was like, it took a big leap of faith. Um, Kendra is probably the one who deserves a lot of credit for, for this up here on stage because she walked alongside me and, and getting me into a life group and showing me what God had to offer and the friendships that I truly needed to put value to. And one thing just led to another. A life group led to a purpose group. A purpose group led to being a pastor's wife. And that wasn't in my story either. <laughs> um, <we're> Some days <laughs> Jody wishes it wasn't in her story either, but here we are. Yeah, it's definitely a work in progress. But, um, yeah, I just encourage everyone that I we could be here for plenty of sermons to tell my life story. But this definitely wasn't a place where I ever thought I would be. But I would never turn around and, and go back either. So don't miss what she said about Kendra. Like, I didn't know that part of the story. But when you guys gather to pray and you meet strangers that you didn't know before, when you turn after a service and you meet somebody, or when you do decide to jump into a group and, you know, take that leap of faith, God is going to connect you to people that he, you were supposed to be connected. Him guiding your steps, right? Him directing your steps. And he's going to put people in place that are going to impact your life forever. It happened with Tanya and Dave. And you're going to impact their life. Don't think these are just casual acquaintances, casual conversations that are happening. These are God-ordained moments that if you lean into them, they'll change the trajectory of your life. And it's that big. So there's, there's a scripture, Ecclesiastes 3.1. This is kind of maybe the, the flagship scripture. For everything, there's a season, a time for every activity under the sun. This goes along with your mission statement that is leading people to Christ in all seasons of life. You're reaching people in all seasons of life right now. You guys gather on Wednesday nights uh, in downtown uh, or Old Town Bellevue at a, a place called Lift Up Sarpy. That's where Tanya actually works as well. That's the building they meet at. Uh, what time do you guys, is it 6.30? 5.30. 5.30. We do dinner and then uh, fellowship. Yeah. So, and they're getting a, a, a hefty group of people already. So t tell us, snapshot, I wrote down, in what ways have you seen God show up as you've been gathering already in lives being changed and impacted? So I'll just start off. We've already had, even though we're not officially launched church, we've already had six decisions for Christ since we started. <laughs> and, and talking about God's plans being bigger, the first decision I, I wanted to share, um, if you had talked to me five years ago, and if you had said, what was, asked me what my opinion was with somebody that would say there was involved in, a, in an incident of child abuse that ended in the death of a child, I, my thoughts on that would be very dark, I'll be honest. Um, I just, yeah, I had no remorse for somebody of that position. I, you know, yeah, the thoughts that would go through my mind, you know, give me five minutes with them in a room, it was just bad stuff. So let's fast forward to with everything that, that's, that we've talked about so far. Um, there was an incident. We had seen it on the news. And Tanya gets a call from an acquaintance of, 
what we saw in the news. And they're looking for someone, a, a pastor or a chaplain or someone to come. And, and when she's telling me this, I'm thinking back in my mind, oh, they're probably looking for someone to do the, fu the funeral. And she goes, no, no, Tony goes, that's not what they want. And I'm like, okay, what do they want? They, they want you to go to the jail and talk to the father. Yeah, no, this ain't going to happen. Woke up that morning, it was pretty clear. That, yeah, no, you're, you're going over to the jail. So after praying on it, of course, and I was like, wow, okay. So I went over and I, you know, talk about nerves and whatnot, because it's just not a situation I ever thought I saw I do. And I, I met the gentleman and we met for about six weeks, weekly basis, hour, an hour and a half each week. And, and, all, and uh, he had grown up with knowledge of, of Christ, knowledge of Jesus, but I wouldn't say he was saved. And I learned more about the situation, and it wasn't, he let anger take over a moment. It wasn't a thought-out process. It wasn't evil. It was just a bad decision in a bad moment that led to what happened. And after six, seven weeks, uh, we ended up baptizing him in the jail. And since then, he's actually started his own little ministry inside the jail. And it's actually leading to more decisions. And he's, you know, guys are coming up to him in the jail asking for a verse or for a prayer or for something. So when we say God's plans are bigger than yours, yeah, me going and doing a jail ministry, yep, that wasn't anywhere in my thought process. And it wasn't until almost two years into this that I became a chaplain for the fire department that I thought I was originally going to be. He wanted to make sure that all these other different things were going to happen first. So. I don't know if there would be a, yeah. That story, I don't know if there would be a lower point in a person's life than having such a moment of rage where you kill your own child and you want to talk about a place of hopelessness, but then for somebody to bring you hope. And this is what's happening through the church already. You guys are already doing outreaches. You're reaching other people. I think we have some pictures of just things you've done for outreach. Uh, th this was maybe just Saturday. This was um, Bellevue's homecoming parade. Okay. And so we have been just trying to get to know the community and uh, bringing along all of the awesome leaders that are within our group. So you see uh, the amazing Chris. And uh, then this is last Sunday. We were handing out um, bags of microwave popcorn to the community. We had 3,000 people come through our line and handed out 800 invitations. Wow. Wow, that's so awesome. Is this that same one? Yep, yep. same activity. Um, right there in the, uh, the printed shirt, the lady with the gray hair, um, that is Susan. And when you talk about impact, Susan and Kurt belong to a church in Bellevue, and they met us at the homecoming parade. And they belong to a church that has been decreasing in numbers even pre-COVID. And so when they saw the invitation to come in and to meet us and who we were, they really were just kind of looking for some more engagement. So they came on Wednesday evening, and coincidentally, they knew Elizabeth Modesto, and so there was an instant connection. Um, but they were just looking for fellowship. Their church had really just even lost the spirit is what they had talked about. And um, so they just wanted something that kind of filled their cup during the week. And then they were hoping to take that back to their church on Sundays and have a renewed spirit in their church. Um, they've been amazing and just brought such great energy. In. And Susan now goes above and beyond every Wednesday to cook and uh, specifically makes dishes that are gluten-free. And it's just bringing back community, right? Just getting to know your neighbors. And we obviously, we want their church to succeed. And, and wherever Susan and Kurt end up one day, that's God's plan. Um, but we just love the fact that it's bringing energy to that Old Town Bellevue area. So lives are being impacted. You're gathering Wednesdays. You're seeing 25, 30 people coming at a time, which is a huge pre-gathering already. Susan's life is changing. That gentleman in the prison, obviously his life's transformed. Others that are already, I mean, six decisions for Christ. How, how has your life changed? Like personally, obviously, we know that 
you're going to school, become ordained. Uh, you know, Tanya, you're along for this ride. Not just along for the ride, but you're truly the lead pastor, and he's probably the backup. But anyway, that, I'm just saying, Gay likes when I say those things. So, uh, <laughs> but how, how, have, how have your lives changed in this journey? Wow. Uh, where to begin on that one? Um, yeah, a lot of dramatic, a lot of little things too, but you know, it's it's funny because you know some of the things I you can point directly to is is I used to you know be so tied up and worried about politics. I, that was like my almost like a side passion of mine. I could care less nowadays. I, I it's just You're it's not, not arguing with people online. No, no, um, the priorities has changed, and I think that's the biggest thing. You you start looking at different aspects of your life, and you start going, okay, what is the priority? What is really important in the life? And it's that relationship that you have with Jesus Christ and walking in step with the Holy Spirit. And if you're not doing that, um, then, you know, one thing we're called to is to share the word, to share that, that strength. And if you're not doing that, I think you're, you're missing something. And so for me, that's the priority in life now. It's, yeah, it, you, it's shifted from temporal things to eternal yeah, things. It's, uh, you know, I used to worry about, you know, what vehicle I was driving, you know, you know how new it was and, you know, now I'll probably drive the Jeep until it's falling apart, and, you know. That's, that's my motto, drive it till the wheels fall off. Yeah, so, yeah, those priorities, we downsized. Uh, we had a relatively new five-bedroom, two-story, I don't know how many square feet, but, I mean, you, you could, you know, put 30 people in that room, still your house, and still had more than enough room. We downsized, moved into an older home, uh, house about 50 years old, and, and it's great. Yeah, these decisions that you're making, I'm moving closer, obviously, to the Bellevue area, downsizing your home. It's not as not, not a nice car, not as nice home, but it's all part of the vision yeah. to get to where God wants you to be and make it happen. It's interesting because um, I grew up where things were important, and uh, we were very competitive as a family in, in a good way, um, whether it be sports or just in success. And so I came from a family of entrepreneurs. And so it's, it's been a hard thing for them to adjust to. Um, but I can't even just begin to tell you, like, when Dave talks about s some of these little things and, and big things, when the change really shifted, like when your mind really shifts and you start intentionally praying with your spouse or with your family and you intentionally start living your life to share God and, and to introduce people to Jesus, and you intentionally are doing your tithing, I, I can't even I can't even tell you. Like the bad days aren't so bad anymore, you know? And the good days, oh my gosh, they're amazing. Um, you know, just in being in a room full of people with you and then taking meadows into another room on Wednesdays and sharing this energy and the spirit with them in Bellevue, I, I can't put a value on it. I hope you just heard that. So Meadows, you, you're a church that would believe in the vision of church planting because that's how the early church did it. You, you give, you pray, you support, crossover in all seasons. Many times you don't even know that we need to remind you of what you're giving to. So from, from us to you and from Pastor Casey, who's giving a message right now in Bennington, Nebraska, I'm just telling you, uh, first of all, thanking you for giving and for supporting the cause of all seasons and of meadows and of a crossover and future churches that uh, you might be leading someday. Who knows what God will do? But uh, I'm telling you, you're giving to that gentleman in the jail and uh, to Susan whose life is changing and to other people that are surrendering their life to Christ. So since service is kind of mixed up today, the service order, um, I'll just show you the ways that you can give and thank you for doing that and know that when you do, you are giving to life change. You're giving, their lives have been transformed. That's what you're giving to. And if you're not ready, maybe it's, your heart's not in it, then, then don't do it. I tell you that. God says, I love a cheerful giver. So if, if it's not there, that's, that's okay. Keep coming. God, God, God will do things in you, just like he has in all of us. Um, that, that's fine. It's not about getting your money. It's about, it's about your heart and God. So just thank you, thank you, whether it's the Venmo or whether it's online. or uh, you're, you're, it's, it's going to not just meadows, and I love that because the impact, when you get to heaven someday, God, God will show you the impact that you made, not just financially giving, but that will be a piece of it. So thank you for that. 
what, what are some, let's close. What are some specific ways that we as Meadows Church can support you as you approach the official launch of all seasons? Um, you meet at 5.30 on Wednesdays at Lift Up Sarpy. You provide food, so you're one-upping Meadows on that, so take that, Meadows Church. So you provide food every Wednesday for people to come eat, which is awesome, because you know, Jesus had food too. He had, he, he brought a gathered them together. I love that. I, I first want to, I want to thank a few people. Um, you know, the Modestos, Berlinskis, Johnstons, um, Emily. Uh, we, there, those are people that are part of the, the, the red team that are helping plant and they're, they're doing an amazing job and amazing work. Um, but you know, to help support us, you know, well, as, as the wristband. Pray for me to be a pastor's wife. <laughs> yeah. Right? You guys know Dave. Amen. Pray first. <laughs> yeah, definitely pray first. Uh, we definitely can always use prayer. So, you know, we're working on a final location. We got three options right now we're looking at, and it's like to start. And so prayer is there for where we're going to start on Sundays. Um, obviously, with, with the giving, that's huge. I'll be honest. That was one part um, when it came to my walk in faith. I struggled with probably the hardest. And uh, one thing that helped me coming from, I came from a Catholic church like him, you know, you see this huge Catholic church and all these great cathedrals and all this money, you know, in property and stuff. But when I came to Meadows, I, I was jokingly at one time, I said, you know, it, so where, where does the, the tithing tear go? And I think it was Pete. He was like, well, here, and he with the, the laptop around and showed me. I mean, there was such an open you know, view on it. I was like, okay, this is new. But uh, it definitely helped me with, with the stubbornness I had to, to release that and, and to start giving. Um, and one thing I'd also would ask people to pray on is, are you called to come and help all seasons? We, we, we definitely need more people. There's, there's key positions uh, to help us out, to, to do outreach, to do internal processes, all kinds of stuff that we still need. You know, we have the dream teams here. You know, we, we still need people that are going to be willing to serve and, and just help us grow. It's an opportunity, I think, not just to be part of a church, but to be the church and help grow the church for his kingdom. So, and I yeah. think it's just an amazing calling to uh, have. That's good. Um, and I hope you heard that ask. Like, he's asking, Tanya's asking, and I'm asking, if God, you need to pray on it, too. Because some of you are like, that ain't, no, I'm right here. <laughs> I'm telling you, I thought the same thing. And if you have questions for Dave or Tanya, talk to them. They'll take you out to dinner and explain more of the vision if you're like, I don't. But you, I want you really praying. Maybe you're called to be there for a season of launch for a year. Maybe you're called to be part of the family. Like if you live over in Bellevue, closer to Old Town, you should seriously at least consider um, a heartfelt prayer about it. And, and, and God will lead you to that. But for us to be the church that God's called us to be, we understand something. We have to send people. And everything in me, because I'm, you know, I, I, I'm a selfish person, my heart is selfish, wants to keep everybody, and, 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 oh, let's do this at Meadows, but everything in the Bible says otherwise. Everything in the Bible says, give it all away. So whether that's money giving to you or to Casey, I don't care, whether it's people, um, you know, my wife has to stay, Jody, you're staying, so anyway, so uh, <laughs> just saying, um, kids, eh. no, I'm kidding, you're staying too, but like, if you live closer to Old Town than you do here, pray. And even if you don't, we have people that live in Papillion that are part of Crossover in Bennington. So pray about being part of something that is life-changing transformation. There's nothing more uh, exciting and crazy than a new church up and running because it's, it's, it's nuts, all hands on deck, and it's crazy. And if you want to be a part of something that's truly like, what is happening here? Man, talk to Dave and Tanya. Uh, they would love to talk to you at least and have you pray over them. And uh, let's pray over them now, should we? Yeah. God, if you, li would you lift a hand out towards them? Would you do that? Let's just, let's just really anoint them. Father, I thank you so much for Dave and Tanya and their willingness to share the vision of All Seasons Church launching March 2024. Father, it, you, you've done more in them than anybody around them, and yet people around them are being transformed too. But that's what you do. You change something in us before you do something through us. And God, I pray that the congregation, as they listen to the vision of all seasons, if they have questions, they'll ask. If they, I pray that we will continually be a praying church, a giving church, that we can support visions all over that you're calling out of meadows to other areas. 
And I just thank you so much for their heart to say yes to you. Bless their children. God bless their family. Uh, bless the core team that's already said yes. Martine, Elizabeth, Emily, they, they, Tori, Ryan. I mean, so many Chris and Quinn uh, that are already part of the family and others that are going to join over these next weeks and months, God. So may we be ob obedient to do whatever you call us to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we give it up one more time for Dave and Tanya? Will you guys take these chairs back? All right, let's close it out. One church can't do it. If we wanted to be a big mega church at Meadows Church, I believe we could be. I, I, I knew wholeheartedly when we moved here, this church is going to get big. This church is going to grow. God's hand is on it. Not because of me, but because of he. We could, we could look really good in our community. Boy, I could be a really prominent pastor. It's not what I want. I mean, if God, I want God to grow our church. That would be stupid not to say. I want to reach as many people as possible. But it's not just about Meadows Church. It's about the kingdom of God. And we must release people. We must release resources. We must give it all away. Because we've been given so much. And we have to reach as many people as possible. So with that said, I wrote this. One church cannot accomplish the mission by itself. Some of you in this room, you may not be part of all seasons or crossover, but one day you're going to plant a church. And you're like, you're like me, you're laughing right now. That's, dude, what I was doing last night, I ain't playing. Yeah, I was doing the same thing last night, years ago. Some of you are going to be part of a church plant. Might not be all seasons, might be. You need to pray. And some of you are going to sell out right here at Meadows Church and give your life away. If you're looking for a church home, if you're new, where's the best place you can give your life away? I believe Meadows is one of the great churches, not the only one, but it's one of them, because we want what God wants. Different religions don't, by the way, how do churches get planted, people will ask me. It isn't by religions. Different religions don't plant churches. Different denominations don't plant churches. Different networks don't plant churches. You know who plants churches? Churches plant churches. People plant churches. And God uses those churches to change the world. It's you and it's me. We go out. I'm not waiting for our denomination to say, you know what, we, we've orchestrated this bishop. is good. No. We're praying to God. I want what God wants. God wants to use you as much as Dave or Tanya or me. The calling on your life is that big. But before God can do something through you, I said it earlier, he wants to do something in you today. So many people, I'm going to walk in God's steps. You're not even obeying God today. That's what God would tell me. Monty, you should probably quit doing drugs first. Okay, yeah, yeah, you're right, God. You know, it's like, so what is God calling you to do today? What is God calling you to throw to the side today? How is God going to bring you to the foot of the cross today? Because before God can do something in me, he needs to do something through me. What season of life are you in? I love the shirts on the back. You'll see on the back of their shirts, there's these three trees. Yeah, the, there. I love that. Leading people to Christ in all seasons of life. Some of you, you're in a full season. And that's great. And we praise God for full seasons because they happen. Right? Things are going fairly good. The marriage, we haven't killed each other. The kids, they're still living under our household. Jobs are okay. Money's coming in. It's pretty full. Others, it's, <laughs> you're the middle tree. And you're half in, you're half out. And these areas are okay, and maybe this area and that relationship. But over here, man, I'm not going to show that on social media. I'm not going to show anybody that because that's, that's, well, let's just focus over here, can we? And you're half, you got half the leaves and half are on the ground. And others, you know that you know that you know you're in a barren season. It's like when I walked in church that first day, dead man walking, you know, part two. It was unbelievable. And that's where you're at. And you're dead on the inside and you know it. And that's why God has you watching online right now. And that's why God has you in the room right now. And regardless of the season that you're in, I'm telling you, whether it's a, a full season or a barren season, it's a Jesus season. He, you need him desperately and so do I. And it's never too late. We talked about that, didn't we, Dave and Tanya? It's never too late. You're never too old, right? When, we, when Jody and I planted churches, I was 74 years old. I'm just kidding. That's not true. But... Moses was 80, I can tell you that, when he got called into ministry through a burning bush. First time guest in the room, I love you. Welcome home.
we'd love to meet you in a few minutes after the service, after we sing a, a song and worship the Lord, and you pray to the, with a prayer team. Those, those connect cards, they're, they're green cards on the chair backs. We would love for you to fill that out. Turn it into guest services, and we'll give you a gift just to bless you in a little way to tell you that you are loved by the King of King and Lord of Lords. Or you can scan a code on the back of the chair. Either way, just tell the, uh, the green table people that you did that and bring them your card. Let us bless you. And thank you for being here. Saul is probably the most prominent Christian that ever walked the earth. Scholars probably don't debate it too much. More than Peter, more than John. Because you don't hear a lot about Peter and John later in the New Testament. But Paul, who, he was Saul and then he became Paul. Dude, he planted churches that planted churches. I like that. You know what Saul's plan was when he came on the scene in Acts 8? This was his plan. Kill Christians and destroy the church. That was Paul's plan. I'll read you scripture. Acts 8 is when he's introduced to you and me. Acts 8.3. I don't have this one on the screen. Don't freak out, production. This came to me last night. But Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging men and women out, throwing them into prison, condoning Stephen's murder, somebody who loved the Lord, Stephen. That's what Saul's plan was. So, uh, he has an encounter with the Lord that I pray to God you have today. And later in Acts, Acts 20, this, Acts 20, 21, this is what he says. The guy that was killing Christians and dragging people out to throw them into prison. He says this. I've got one message. I've had one message for Jews, for Gentiles, for pe people in full seasons, half seasons, dead seasons. For blacks and whites and Democrats and Republicans. I got one message for everybody. The necessity of repenting from sin. Turning to God and having faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Wait a minute, Paul. The same Jesus you didn't even believe in and you hated people following? Yeah, him. What changed? Paul met Christ. Like he met him. He didn't just know about him. He just didn't memorize scripture about him. Like he met him. When you meet Christ, it will change you. It changed him. That's the gospel. Christ Jesus died for you. I appreciate Dave and Tanya's articulation of the gospel and that guy in, that was dying on his deathbed. You know, what he was, you know what he's freaking out about? I haven't done enough good. I'm going to burn in hell. And then Dave got to walk up to him and say, you know what? You're right. You haven't done enough good. <laughs> Neither have I. But that's not the criteria. According to the word of God and according to Christ himself, you are saved by God's grace through faith when you put your faith in Christ. That's why Paul's saying repent. Because repentance, turning away from sin, is part, of, is part of believing. It's not perfection, but you don't want it anymore. It's bigger than just praying a prayer. I want Jesus. Please forgive me. I'm good. Now I'm going to go back to the porn, back to the drugs, back to the same friends and the same speaking and the same debauchery. Well, that, that, that's no hard change. See, you believe in Jesus, but you're dead on the inside, just like I was. See, salvation is, I believe in Jesus. I'm still jacked up. I still want to go do drugs. I kind of want to look at that porn. I kind of want to hang out with those same people, but I, I want you too. And then it's like, God, help me want you more. Help me want that less. And help me want you more. Because I'm torn. Because there's this battle between my flesh and my spirit. But God, today at the foot of the cross, I repent. I turn from my sin and I turn to you. By faith, I believe your son Jesus was, is the savior of the world. That he died on a cross. That he rose from the dead. And I want to surrender my life to him. Come into me and make me new. See, if you will pray that with a heart that is repentant, the Holy Spirit will enter into you and make you new. And you may not feel any different, but I'm telling you, you are different. And eventually you will change. And when that happens, it'll change how you act. You can do that by marking it on your card, marking it in the comments, or just come tell me. Come tell somebody. However you do it, 
But I'm telling, I'm giving you gold right here. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know, you want to know how much it impacted Paul's life? You know, the Christian killer, the church destroyer? Here's what he said. Acts 20, 24. Uh, give me two minutes. I'm done. It's so good. God, the word of God. God, I'm praying right now that it penetrates the hearts of people like only you can. Acts 20, 24. But my life is worth nothing. Like, it doesn't matter unless I use it for finishing the work assigned by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news of the wonderful grace of God. Nothing else matters. You will die. Your family will die. Your work won't matter. It's going to be gone. But you in Christ, that's why it's the most important thing. When you make him first, all of a sudden those other things, they, they, it adds value to them. But we must sell out to Christ first. When you leave, the world's going to draw you in with all this crap. I pray that you continually invite, by the way, telling others the good news. Those invite cards that are by the doors when you leave or into the back of the pockets there, the little green cards, God, take one today. We start a brand new series next week. I'm not even going to tell you what it's about, but it's going to be so good because God's all over it. God wants to open doors for you today, I believe. God wants you to follow his steps. You can make the plans, God determines the steps. You make the plans, God determines the steps. If you walk in the steps, your life will change. God will, God will open doors for you that nobody can shut. No hater, no demon, no devil, no body. And if you will walk through those doors, your life will never be the same. I promise. Is the team up? Good, let's stand to our feet. We're going to praise God in a song. I'm going to pray over you. And then you're going to get more prayer. And you're going to visit guest services. And you're going to take a step of faith. You might talk to Dave or Tanya. I don't know, but I don't want to play church. I want to be the church. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for your word and your truth. Thank you for all seasons church. Thank you for Dave and Tanya being obedient to the call. Thank you for Casey and Crossover in Bennington, Nebraska right now. Thank you for Meadows and the people right here, right now, the people watching online, God. Do a work in their hearts. Do a work in their minds, God. Renew us. Change us. Make us new. In Jesus' name I pray, and the church says, amen. amen. Hey, I want to thank you so much for tuning in today. But don't stop there. Like or subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video, update, or message. And not only that, share this message with a friend or somebody that you know. So many people out there need hope and encouragement, and you have the ability to bring that to them. Finally, if you're in the Omaha area, we would love to have you join us. We would love to meet you. God bless you.